Sad, very sad. I just hope that they they catch them yeah, and fast. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizzela K. This is Grizzly True Crime. And today we are back talking about the Rachel Morin case. One we never forget about. We've covered it multiple times on this channel. I constantly share her flyers as well on X, you know, because this is an unsolved case. And yet they have a surveillance video of the suspect, even though it's only of his back. Okay. And uh, they've got his DNA, but they don't know his identity. So today's big news because there's finally a composite sketch of what they believe this suspect looks like. Now I'm going to give you a quick recap of the case because maybe many of you have never heard of this case so don't worry about that. We'll do that quickly. Then I'll give you the updates. Uh, Christina says haven't visited for a bit. Love to Yuji and Grizzly fam. Thank you so much Christina. I see some people in chat saying no emojis. Like what is that all about? What is YouTube doing? Do you have emojis or no? Like what are they doing? Anyway, I hope that you will have your members uh, emojis again soon and all the other ones. You know, YouTube's always changing something. So make sure that you are subscribed, speaking of which, because sometimes they automatically unsubscribe you, okay? Subscribe, make sure you've got all your notifications on so that you don't miss uh, streams like this and news and things like that. So let me quickly remind you over here. Now we do have a playlist, okay? And uh, it is linked in the description box. So if you do want to catch up on the case and see all the presentations at a slower pace and a deep dive and everything and really know what's what in this case, it's there, okay? So, all right, let me quickly get this presentation here just to remind you. Rachel Morin was born on May 20th of 1986 in Dover, Stratford County, New Hampshire, USA. We've just been in New Hampshire for a trial. We are following the Adam Montgomery trial. So, yes, okay. Um, 37, she was a 37-year-old mother of five. Uh, from Ballier, Maryland at the time. Her boyfriend was Richard Tobin and she had her own cleaning business. And um, th the rest is just part of the deep dive, of course. Um, so that was just a quick overview. Let me not do the whole presentation. I will instead tell you about this quickly. This will be a better summary where they said, so here's some of the composite sketches now that the police have just released which is amazing. There's actually quite a bit of news to discuss in this case. So we'll be here for about an hour or more, I would say. Okay, so sketch of suspect in Rachel Moran's murder released six months after the mom of five was killed on a hiking trail. It's a terrifying story of what seems like stranger danger. We don't know if the suspect specifically targeted her, if he knew her, but it's terrifying because it seems like one of those cases. It almost reminds me of the Delphi case a little bit, you know. So police in Maryland have released a sketch of the suspect who they believe killed Rachel Morin, a mother of five who was found dead after she went missing in August, according to authorities. The Hartford County Sheriff's Office in Bel Air, Maryland, shared two photos of the sketch on Monday morning. See why I say it reminds me of Delphi. At least these two sketches look similar, right? But there's two sketches and it's like this hiking path, a walking trail. I mean, she just went out there on a walk. Okay, so police in Maryland released this. I'll show it to you again just now. Um, I would love if you could please like and share this with hashtag Rachel Morin, okay? And for the flyers that uh, myself and Grizzly Cat are always sharing on X, please also repost those if you are following me. My handle is at True Crime Gizzla on X, especially the ones in Spanish, okay? Because they need to reach the Hispanic community who could be hiding out in there. That's what the detective said, right? 
Okay, so they said the Harford County Sheriff's Office in Bel Air shared two photos of the sketch on Monday morning. Morin, 37, was reported missing on August 5th. So that's the little summary for you guys if you've never heard of this case. She was reported missing on August 5th by her boyfriend who said that she went out for a run on the Monpar Trail in Bel Air, Maryland, but never returned. Morin was found dead the next day when a volunteer who joined a search party discovered her along the trail. So yeah, this case had all the usual suspects. We, uh, the boyfriend was a red flag and then the guy who was on the trail and discovered her, red flag. <laughs> all of that happened. A social media ghost, you know. But I mean, they are the most obvious people to look at first and the police also did so. So they said uh, Harford County Sheriff Jeffrey Geller said at a news conference at the time that they were plenty of indicators that left no doubt that Morin was murdered. Sadly, it's a homicide case, the sheriff said. Now remember this. I'll show you the video again in case you've never seen it. But this is all they have. This is what they have, okay? A little clip, a video from a home invasion and assault in Los Angeles. That's all the way on the other side of the country. Very interesting. And they got the guy's DNA from there. Once they had found DNA at the scene where Rachel Morin was found and loaded that into that CODIS you know, database, there was a hit for DNA at this scene. Now, they're going to talk a little bit more about that in the podcast episode we're going to listen to together. Shortly afterwards, the Harford County Sheriff's Office released a surveillance video on social media of the suspect who's seen leaving a home following a home invasion in Los Angeles, California. The Los Angeles Police Department confirmed later that month that DNA obtained in the Rachel Morin murder matches that of a suspect identified in a residential burglary and assault on March 26th of 2023. So, I have to march March, April, May, June, July, August, five months earlier. In Monday's statement, Harford Police said authorities believe the suspect may have been in the area for a few days before Morin's murder. While he was here, where did he stay? Who did he speak to? Where did he work? The statement reads, urging anyone with information to come forward. The unidentified man is described as 5 feet 9 inches tall, 160 pounds, 20 to 30 years old, with dark hair and a muscular frame and is believed to be of Hispanic descent. Anyone with information leading to an arrest and conviction is subject to a $35,000 reward. Now, do you guys remember the reward was always $30,000? So, the reward did just go up. Why? Because, you guys know Kendall Ray? She just donated $5,000 to this. Her and her husband. The reward for information leading to the arrest of Rachel Morin's killer increased on Monday to $35,000. The law firm representing the family said, The increase comes after a $5,000 mile higher a true crime podcast donation hosted by husband uh, and wife Josh Thomas and Kendall Ray. They said, we are profoundly grateful to the Mile Higher podcast for their generous contribution to the Rachel Morin, uh, let me just make this bigger, reward fund. Lawyer Randolph Rice said in a statement, this increase in funds represents the solidarity of the community in the relentless pursuit of justice for Rachel Morin. It sends a clear message that we will leave no stone unturned in our efforts to find answers and bring the man responsible to justice. It's been nearly six months since Marilyn Mother of Five was found dead in the Marin Park Heritage Trail in Hartford County. The Hartford County Sheriff's Office released a video as we just went over. Let me show you that video. This is the video that they had previously released. Okay, so I'm going to make this bigger. Uh, I've got to quickly do a resize. And they're going to give us a little bit more information in this podcast episode. So I do want to show you this so that you have some context for it, okay? All right, so uh, let's go from the beginning here. And there we go. This is what they have. This is from March in Los Angeles. And as we know, they call that the, the infamous arm as this guy is leaving. See, he's going out like that. And then we see somebody's arm here, letting them out. And people are speculating wildly of what is going on there and how could it be and all of that, right? So, uh, that is the video. It's on my playlist as well. You can watch it many times. You can share it. It's on Facebook as well. So... Maybe you, if you look at it and you recognize this person, yeah, please call the tip line. Okay, I'll put that all in the description box as well. I just quickly want to read you what they said here. Now I've got to resize this as well. Just stand by. So from the Harford County Sheriff's Office. I'm very glad that they are making some progress in this case, you know. It's been really terrifying to think that what, like, what this guy is capable of, right? We're going to listen to that Meg Fletcher to the podcast. That's what we're doing right now. So, Rachel Morin updates and new details. This week marked six months since Rachel Morris, uh, Morin sorry, was needlessly and tragically killed while on the Mon Pod Trail in Bel Air. 
we sat down with Captain Andy Lane, who's overseeing the investigation, to find Rachel's killer to record the special edition of Into the Sheriff's Spotlight with never-before-released details. We hope you'll take a listen. That's what we're going to do together, okay? Over the last six months, detectives have conducted more than 100 interviews and followed up on more than 1,000 tips. The investigation has led them to seven different states with 10 federal, state, and local agencies assisting. Thousands of bilingual flyers have been distributed in Maryland and California. This investigation has not slowed or stalled. Thank you, Tracy, for reminding everyone. We do have a full playlist on this case. We've done a deep dive on this case. We've spoken about this case to uh, criminal profiler John Kelly as well. So go and check out the playlist so you can catch up on all the details as well. This is really just an update episode. So they said, um, so the case is not cold, right? Just this week, we were able to finalize a sketch of the suspect. That's huge news. Listen to Captain Lane explain how the sketch was developed and then please take a look and share the sketch. We believe there are still people who can provide information. Detectives believe the killer may have been in the area for days before the crime. While he was here, where did he stay? Who did he speak to? Where did he work? If you have a tip, please continue to send information to RMT or RM Tips. So Rachel Morin Tips at HarfordSheriff.org. The reward stands at $35,000 for information leading to an arrest and conviction. As you listen to the podcast and view the sketch, please keep Rachel's family in your thoughts. As Captain Lane offers, remember Rachel, remember the area she was in, and if anyone remembers anything moving forward, those small details can be the details that break the case open. In closing, we'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to the community for its support throughout this challenging time. Your cooperation and solidarity are invaluable as we strive to find answers and deliver justice. Podcast links in the comments. Now I'm going to show you the sketch uh, nice and big here so that you could see it. I think the, the cap is very telling as well, right? They're giving, I mean, a red cap. Much more details being shown here. That would be what, an Air Jordan cap, right? Am I right? <laughs> okay. And uh, so I don't know why they're saying that, but th this is what they've shown us on the sketch. It's actually a really good sketch, right? So if you know someone who looks like this and you're suspicious of them, don't just call in anyone and everything. If you have a credible tip, please call the tip line or leave, you know, a tip with those email addresses they provided because five children lost their mother and it's brutal what we've already heard the little bit we've heard about what happened to rachel unthinkable and to think that that day you know she'd gone to the gym she'd gone to for like a spray tan or it was actually a tanning salon right not spray tan like a like a sunbed and then she went for a walk like a nature walk on a trail that is actually used a lot it's popular and the way that she was found in that like tunnel it's so scary Forensic Fero says, gee, always reads to us. She must love us. You know it. <laughs> okay, so here is the sketch. Make sure that you screenshot it or go to the Facebook page and share it. Share it on social media. You guys always make me so proud when I see you on X and everywhere just sharing things like this. It really helps um, it, you know, trend. You guys have often shared my stream so much that Grizzly True Crime <laughs> is trending on X, formerly known as Twitter. So if you could do that with this, hashtag Rachel Morin, that would be Right, right. Okay, so smaller sketch, but here we go. Interesting. Now we can finally see the front of his face because previously we just saw the video with his back, right? Yeah, Gene says, uh, just an innocent walk. Yeah, and I've seen um, the interview room's coverage. I've seen um, somebody interview Rachel, one of Rachel Moran's daughters. I mean, she's absolutely devastated, of course. Yeah, I'm always following this case and, you know, looking, well, what's the update? It's so scary to think that someone like this could invade a house. And you'll hear now on the podcast where they say it's like this guy didn't know anyone in the house. He went in there and just started assaulting people. It sounds like physically assaulting, like violence. We'll, we'll listen together now. And then at some point moved all the way across the country and ended up there in Maryland. And then viciously attacked Rachel Morin. So his behavior definitely escalated. And uh, criminal profiler John Kelly was saying, like, this is like the making, it's like a budding serial killer, right? You don't know what he's going to do next, and he probably will kill again. It's very likely for someone like this to kill again before he's caught, which is a very scary thought. To so truly sa save a life, we've got to share, 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 and hope that this guy is caught ASAP, which is why it's important to share the Spanish flyer as well. So if you see me sharing that, please share it too. Because I see a lot of people repost the English one, but not so much the Spanish one, and we need that one. All right, so 
Now, they did also uh, post this on X, so I've shown you the update though. Now we're going to get to this little podcast here, which is into the share of spotlight. Okay, let's do it like this. Into the share of spotlight. All right, and we're going to listen together. <laughs> let's see, can I change the speed on here? I don't think so. Oh my goodness, we're going to have to listen at normal speed. <laughs> you know how I listen to podcasts, but let's listen to this together. It's 14 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to be listening and taking notes. You do the same and let's see. Maybe I'll pause. I don't know. If something's like, oh, my word, then I'm going to pause as usual. Make commentary, right? Now, I just thought it's better than sharing the link and each one listening individually. Let's rather listen to it together. Make some notes, make bullet points and make some social media posts. You know, many of you have social media accounts. Whatever you learn here, share it, share it. Get the sketches and share it. Okay, so here we go. All right. Hi, this is Sheriff Jeff Gale, yeah, Harford County Sheriff, and um, welcome to this special edition of the Sheriff Spotlight. I, I, I got to say, I wish it was a happier topic that we were going to start off with uh, for a special one, but uh, today's episode, we're going to be uh, discussing the uh, Rachel Morin homicide case that our office has been investigating, and uh, we are now at the six-month anniversary since uh, that tragic day and that loss of life uh, here in our community and uh, you know still working hard on solving this case our investigators uh, are, are focused on it every single day uh, but joining me today for this special broad broadcast is uh, Major Jack Simpson who's the chief of our investigative services bureau and uh, leading the investigation into the case uh, from our office is Captain Andy Lane who's the commander of our criminal investigations division and I'm going to ask Andy, just to, you know, we're going to get started here and just maybe a little bit of recap, although I think the whole world knows Rachel's story. We think uh, we know there's people out there who still need to be caught up. So a little bit about what happened six months ago. Yes, sir. So the, the sheriff's office uh, began this investigation when we received a, a phone call about a, a missing mother that uh, she had gone for a run that evening and uh, she didn't return. Her children, who were younger children, uh, one of them uh, a teenager and the other one uh under that age was were left at home and that wasn't like her. She normally would leave for a run in the evenings and be home within 45 minutes. So when she didn't return, a friend of hers called the sheriff's office and said that uh, they were concerned for her well-being and they didn't know where she was. Uh, the sheriff's office, of course, started looking right away and, and tried to find Miss Morin. And what they located right away was uh, Rachel's vehicle at a trailhead uh, along a popular trail here in Hartford County called the Mon Pa Trail. Um, at this point, it was probably about later evening, 10 o'clock in the evening, and, and it was concerning that her vehicle would still be there because uh, although she frequently ran that trail, she would not have been there that late into the evening. Um, so that uh, began a large-scale search uh, through the, um, the Ma and Pa Trail and the surrounding area, uh, which ultimately, unfortunately, led to the, the discovery the following morning of, of, uh, of Rachel's remains. And I, and I remember that day, obviously, very vividly, um, we had two missing person cases going simultaneously. Did you guys think it's cool that they have a podcast episode to update everyone? Like, wow, what a great sheriff's department. My goodness. So there's a picture of Rachel Morin. I'm also going to put a picture of the sketches up as well so that you can see that while we listen. And if you don't know where this is and you want to see some map time and the deep dives, as I say, it's all on the playlist for you. Go and catch up on the Rachel Morin playlist. Uh, we've done a lot of that already. Um, one that was there was some concern, you know, or at least community concern that they could be related, and we knew from the information we had that certainly they were two distinct situations. Um, mm -hmm. One resolved uh, later, you know, fine for everyone involved, and sadly, um, Rachel's case resulted in the discovery of her body. So, um, I, I think um, just a little bit. We'll go ahead into the uh, steps after the discovery. So uh, when, when Rachel's remains were located, the, the Ma and Pa Trail, if anybody's not familiar, is a, um, a large trail that runs through, like I said, a large, uh, about a seven-mile section of Hartford County. This particular uh, portion of the trail is well-graded and, um, and, and open. Off to the, along the side of this trail, there are uh, two uh, large drainage culverts that run under a, a, a local highway. Uh, those drainage culverts are hidden. Uh, during the summertime by trees and shrubbery and aren't something that uh, that most people would see. I myself have been down that trail many times, and I, I wasn't aware that those culverts were there. Uh, in this instance, uh, we could see from the scene that uh, Rachel was ultimately attacked on the trail. That area of the trail, there is a bend in the in the trail that most likely was, was used by the individual who committed this crime. 
who attacked Rachel on the trail, pulled her through the wooded area into these uh, um, into this drainage uh, culvert where she ultimately lost her life. And this is a little bit of information we've kind of held uh, close uh, to the chest, if you will, that we haven't um, released uh, as far as what the actual location of the homicide was. Um, so, you know, we are, um, again, as we hit the, hit the six-month mark, looking back at everything that we've done, um, some of the information that we've been less than, you know, a little leery about releasing too many details. Um, so this is this is something new. A lot of people ask me routinely, is that where? Um, the link to this podcast is on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast it's called Into the Sheriff's Spotlight. And it's found on the Harford County Sheriff's Department's Facebook page, the X page, everywhere. Um, but I will put in the link. I will put the link in the description box afterwards as well. Where is that where this homicide occurred? And um, kind of everyone's familiar with the lar- who's familiar with the trail. Everyone local is familiar with the hiking trail that goes underneath of Route 24. Mm-hmm. These drainage tunnels are north of that a short distance. But as you said, in the summer. Particularly, you can't really make them out. No, they're they're. Uh, I, w- I would say they're not intentionally, but they but they are hidden by shrubbery and and uh, and growth. And a, a lot of people within the community, I don't believe, are aware that they're there. It's not something that the the average person would notice. Um, so it obviously the the location of the um, the attack was was chosen. I think pro- most likely for the uh, because those culverts were as close as they were, and they provided an area uh, for this person to try to commit this crime and not be seen by members of the public. At, at that hour of the day, on this particular day, is that trail well used? This portion of the trail is well used uh, at, um, during this time of the day. Uh, in fact, we've spoken to a number of witnesses who have been able to tell us that not only did they see Rachel that day, but they saw Rachel almost every day at the same time on the trail, walking and running and exercising in the same area. Um, this person obviously took the time to be familiar with the area because he was familiar with the culverts we spoke of, and he was also most likely or potentially familiar with Rachel, who uh, had a time of day she liked to run, and uh, this individual uh, took an opportunity when Rachel, unfortunately, from the witnesses we spoke to, was briefly out of view of anyone else for a short period of time. And I, I've been asked that many in many, many interviews um, over the last six months, um, do we think that she was stalked or do we think that this was a completely random act? And I've been doing, you know, police work 40 years, uh, major Simpson's on par with me and you're just slightly behind that. So a lot of police experience in the room, my, my gut tells me she was stalked. Um, but you know, until we, uh, catch this person, you know, I also, you know, have been putting out there, you know, that the fact that it could have just been a crime of opportunity. He could have laid in wait on that trail, uh, for, uh, Rachel or, or, or whichever um, female decided to come down that trail at a time when there were no other people in sight, you know, more or less a crime of opportunity. Uh, Which is terrifying. Also, just a safety tip, make sure that you switch up your routines. Like if you go for a run at the same time, the same route every single day, try not to do that um, because it can people can actually study your patterns and uh, don't post all your routes on Strava either because people can follow that as we've seen in other cases just a safety tip to consider um so really that's kind of what we have said so far we don't have information we've developed no information to say she was specifically targeted we've developed no information sir that says that she was specifically targeted um however in interviewing witnesses and speaking to people um on the trail at that time uh, it would appear that there was an individual who was uh, standing within the wood line in an area that's uh, slightly elevated uh, immediately around the time of this assault. And uh, I would agree with you, sir, that I don't know that Rachel was specifically targeted, but I do believe that that area was chosen um, as an area that, that they wanted to assault someone. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, that's kind of the distinction we've made. I, I believe, you know, in my heart that she, someone picked her, specifically her but we we uh, until we have him in custody and we can uh, say that 100% uh, it could have been likely he just picked the location and, and Rachel was the unfortunate person who was there at that that time that's correct sir so uh from go ahead from there with objection cases and watch those earbud volumes that as well if you got your airpods or earbuds in don't blast your music or podcast or whatever you're listening to so loud that you can't be aware of your surroundings. Always stay aware, situationally aware. 
stay vigilant, um, maybe carry with whatever you can. Like here in the Netherlands, I'm not allowed to have mace. It's, uh, or, you know, pepper spray is illegal here. Although I see the police now have some and I'm like, oh, really? But it's illegal for all of us. Uh, anyway, <laughs> carry what you can. Uh, there's lots of things you can invest in uh, just to give yourself time to get away, right? Like you get things like, or you can carry your keys with you or something. There's so many things we talked about that before, but yes, switch up your routine, watch your earbud volumes and stay safe. Kind of recapping. Um, so uh, Rachel, uh, as I said, was was located uh, on the trail that day inside uh, that culvert. And that began uh, a long process with the sheriff's office and our forensic services unit processing the crime scene and attempting to recover uh, any type of evidence we could that could link the suspect in this case to the scene. Um, that process took us the remainder of that day and, and into the, the following days as well. Um, after that, after the, the scene was processed, uh, a search began for, which is continuing to this day, a search began for witnesses who were in the area who could describe uh, what they saw, uh, who was in the area, and, uh, and anything else that would help us lead to the suspect in this case. As we were processing the scene and, and what moves happened in the days following, in processing the scene, we recovered um, genetic material that we were able to use uh, through the Maryland State Police Crime Lab to attempt to identify the suspect. That genetic material ultimately was entered into a system called CODIS, which is a, a national DNA database. CODIS contains not only known offenders, but it also contains DNA samples from other unsolved crimes with unknown suspects. In this case, CODIS was a huge break for us. And uh, what, co what we were able to do with that database was link this crime to another unsolved crime uh, in the uh, state of California and Los Angeles specifically, which was a, a, a home invasion is how I would describe it right now. Uh, and in that instance, that suspect left behind uh, a hat. And that hat was collected by the uh, Los Angeles Police Department and DNA was located on that hat and that DNA was entered into CODIS. When we entered our sample in from our... So there it is, a hat. People were saying all kinds of things about the DNA. We're all wondering what kind of DNA. And was it a sexual assault? No, apparently it wasn't. The March 2023 Los Angeles home invasion. Now we know. Oh, he left his hat there. No wonder they've got the sketch with the hat on. Okay. Our crime scene, those two matched. So that allowed us ultimately to be able to recover video evidence that showed us who our suspect was, which we hadn't seen, and uh, allowed us to link two crimes that occurred on opposite sides of the country. And, and I do believe that's another specific piece of information that we've kind of not uh, been, you know, that we have not released previously as far as it being a hat that we, did we release that before? That we, we, have, we have publicly okay. commented so on that, yes. Okay, and I, I knew that, the public knew that we had recovered DNA, or I should say Los Angeles Police Department recovered DNA uh, that matched to our uh, our crime scene here, uh, but I wasn't sure that they what, what the um, tool was or what the uh, item was that was left behind by the suspect. So um, going to that case, and it was in March, so it was basically six months earlier than uh, Rachel's case or five months earlier, uh, the case in, in L.A., and, and I caused me to think, and this is a question I've got a lot, what brought the suspect here? And I've been clear that we really have no information to say that the suspect lives there and came here or that the suspect, very well, the suspect could live out here and have traveled out there in March. We know he was there in March. We know he was here in August. We don't know where he is in between. That's correct, sir. Uh, we know that uh, through the course of the investigation, um, which is in a unique situation when we have two violent attacks that happen on opposite sides of the country within a six-month period. Uh, we're, of course, interested about uh, what other crimes could have occurred throughout the country, throughout the state of California, state of Maryland, and everywhere in between. Uh, we have nothing right now that would indicate yet that there's been other crimes this individual uh, perpetrated in between. However, he could be, as you said, sir, a resident of the state of Maryland who went to California or a resident of the state of California who came here, or he could be a resident of another state and just traveled in between those two. Uh, until we locate him, we really won't know. Okay, and, and, and I know we've also, that case out there, I get that. Can you tell us more about what happened in Los Angeles? And I know that is not our investigation, and we certainly cannot speak on behalf of the Los Angeles Police Department. But as you said earlier, that's an active investigation by that police department. So we've been, I guess, limited in what we are 
uh, going to say or or should say, since another police department has a serious crime that they are also investigating. But what can you share? Uh, obviously, the video came from there. What else can you share about that scene out there? Uh, I think I can share the fact that, yes, this case is actively investigated by the Los Angeles Police Department, who uh, who did initially recover that hat, which was an excellent find and, and enabled us to be able to link these two crimes together. Uh, that crime that occurred there was also a violent attack. Um, there's nothing that uh, we know right now that would point us to the, to the belief that it was anything other than um, a random attack. Um, there were multiple people within that home who were uh, injured, and there were uh, minor children who were injured as well in that attack. I think that case, along with this case, highlight how uh, dangerous uh, this individual is and uh, how important it is to locate him uh, for public safety. Uh, to be clear, the uh, the DNA that was collected from the crime scene in L.A. Uh, was that of an unnamed, as of yet unnamed, suspect. That's correct. <laughs> I was wondering if they're going to say that because they're like, we knew who he was, but they don't know his name. It's an unnamed suspect. They just got a DNA match from that home invasion in Los Angeles in March of 2023, and DNA left at the crime scene where Rachel Morin was found in Maryland. So... Who knows what he did in between that time or since then. That is a scary thought. And if he can just go into a home and violently attack what sounds like just about everyone in it, including minors, yeah, that uh, that sounds really scary. Like what type of profile of a person is that? And hear what they say next. Um, Stefan says multiple people were injured. That's what they say. Yes. Sir. The the CODIS database uh, contain does contain known offenders. I'm sure a, a lot of people are aware that um, people convicted of certain qualifying crimes provide a DNA sample that's that's entered into CODIS. Um, but the CODIS contains also um, standards from unknown crime scenes. And this is an instance where we collected DNA, or the Los Angeles Police Department collected DNA with an unknown suspect. But there's value to that, whether the suspect is known or not, because it allows us to link crimes together, as we did in, in this situation. Okay, um, so go um, go on a little bit with what we can discuss from that crime scene in, in Los Angeles. Um, is, there, is there more that we can speak about? I, I think we could say that um, I think people who see have seen the, uh, the video we released, which is obviously from Los Angeles, uh, this individual uh, approached a, a residence in the city of Los Angeles and um, entered that residence. He didn't live there. He was not known to the residence. Um, and after entering the home, I don't want to get into a whole lot of details other than to say that um, he violently and physically attacked multiple people to include a child uh, that were hurt during that incident. Um, and that, again, I think it just goes to um, the dangerousness and the um, and the need for us to be able to track this person down before he harms someone else. Sure, and this is something else I get a lot of questions about and have spoken about that the escalation from what happened there in March. Uh, again, we don't know whether he's there, here, there, where he might lay his head at night, but we do know um, from March uh, to August, he certainly escalated uh, in violence and in, in moving from assault, you know, even serious, but to taking a life. Um, the kind of the other questions I get uh, related to Los Angeles and the, and the cameras themselves are kind of twofold and maybe I'll throw them both out there and see what you say. Cause one is we have, um, the video footage of the ring doorbell camera of him departing uh, and the manner in which he departs, which does not seem in in most people's views to be the way that someone found in your home illegally assaulting people would be exiting a residence. Um, and if we have him going out, why don't we have him coming in? And when I say... Right. We also discussed that, which is probably him not going through the front door, but going around the side through a window or something. Yeah. Quite something, right? Um, and you've seen the footage that I showed you here. This video is what they're talking about. So just to show you one more time, I mean, I'm just sorry, just could I put this up? Look at him, like, almost apologizing as he leaves or something, like looking very like, okay, okay, look there. That's weird. You know, very interesting case, this one, sure. We, it's not, it's again, that's the Los Angeles crime scene. Yes, sir. Uh, the reason you can't see him entering the home 
um, is because the doorbell camera, obviously, like we all have these doorbell cameras now in modern society, are only placed on generally the area of the front door. Um, without going into to how this gentleman entered the home or the suspect entered the home, he did not enter through the front door and wouldn't have been captured by the doorbell camera. Um, as far as the manner in which he exited the house, uh, we've received comments through tip lines about that too. Um, and I think it, you know we all have to take a step back sometimes and realize that um, this person entered a home. He, uh, in the middle of the night, violently attacked a family, and that family reacted. There's a... Uh, they were scared. They were there was a lot of yelling going around in the, uh, at the time, and they forced him from the home. Um, I think people uh, oftentimes believe that the, this family should have uh, held this person there, or they should have, you know, in, in some way tried to stop him. And I think that's not always possible. And that the uh, this attack was stopped by a member of that family, who I think um, acted in the best interest of everyone there and did everything that he could do to get that person out of the home. And ultimately, um, I think. Although he did escalate his crime, uh, as we were just saying, between uh, here in Maryland and in California, I think had that crime that crime not been interrupted in California, it most likely would have ended the exact same way that, our crime ended here. That's a very good so, point. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that scary? Went into the home in the middle of the night and attacked an entire family, including minors. And they say if, I don't know, people didn't react like they did. I don't know if maybe a dad was there and got protective or had a gun or something. I don't know. Whatever happened there and frightened him away or they chucked him out or whatever, they say it could have ended the same way as Rachel Morin's case ended, which is very sad. That's scary. It's almost like, you know, I don't know if he would be like hearing voices directing him to do things or if he's just violent, just on his own. Like, what's the motive? You know what I mean? That's such a weird thing to like break into a house and attack an entire family and then... Next minute, you're out in Maryland, who knows what he did in between, and brutally attacking a mother on a walk. Very strange, right? Very strange case. Uh, meaning the profile we're starting to build of this suspect. At least now, I don't know why it took so long to make these composite sketches, but at least it's out now, right? Although he did escalate his crime, uh, as we were just saying, between... Uh, here in Maryland and in California, I think had that crime that crime not been interrupted in California, it most likely would have ended the exact same way that, our crime ended here. That's a very good so. point. Yeah, yeah, that's, and I agree with that from what I know of the case. Um, talk to me about the, the arm, uh, the infamous arm, because that's something that so many of our social media followers have commented on, the, the, the arm in the video. The arm in the video is um, the suspect when he's in the home, um, winds up assaulting two family members who were unable to defend themselves. A third family member who um, is a younger person uh, enters that room and manages to surprise that person, manages to surprise the suspect and begin to force him out of the home. Uh, as the suspect flees the home, uh, this individual who is frightened and is scared and is a younger person and doesn't understand why someone's in his home attacking his family members, the suspect, other people in the home begin to wake up. And he realizes now that there's multiple people in, in the home. They're yelling at him. He's trying to just exit the home. So as soon as he leaves the door, that younger person who actually interrupted the crime scene slams the door shut and locks it and then immediately calls the police. So again, we've heard this a lot too, and I understand people are trying to help, but it's, uh, right, good job it's a difficult situation that that young man went through, and I think he did everything he could to try to protect his family, and he just wanted this, the suspect out of his home. And then as soon as he left, locked the door and called the police for assistance. So obviously that's how we tie to Los Angeles and to the video that we were able to release. Um, and, and again, we uh, had a press conference releasing that video as soon as it came into our possession um, to make sure that the public knew what to be on the lookout for in, in hopes of identifying this uh, individual. And here we are six months in and we still haven't been able to get a name. And, and I believe somebody out there is going to see that video and recognize that, that person. That's why it's important for us to keep sharing the video. I don't think the police need us to speculate if he's in the military or a swimmer or a surfer or <laughs> I know we've done those, we've had those conversations. They need us to share it, share it, share it so that Somebody who hasn't yet maybe seen it and actually knows him is like, wait a minute. Sorry, what? You're looking for this guy? Like, I know this guy. Yeah, yeah. Then call it in. If you see him and you recognize him, 
call it in. Now there's sketches and that video as well. Also, I mean, it could be, his motive could be sexual. Yes, and breaking into homes to commit SA in Los Angeles, they intervened. We don't know if Rachel Morin was sexually assaulted yet, right? They, we don't know those details. They're keeping a lot of details, obviously, uh, to themselves to protect the investigation. Most important is to share the sketches, share the video, share the flyers, so that this guy can be caught. But that could be what it is. But damn, however old that uh, young man was that intervened and threw this guy out the house. Wow, what a hero. And then called the police. And immediately started working with the police to share as much information as possible. Okay, so we're, we're almost halfway through this podcast now. We've got about 22 minutes to go. And we just need to make sure it stays in, in the public eye to the best we can. Um, but how many tips uh, related to this case would you say you and your investigators have um, followed up on? And, and I get the question, you know, has this turned to a cold case at this point? This case absolutely has not turned into a cold case, sir. It's being act actively investigated every day. Uh, we were actually just today conducting interviews in this in this case. Uh, we've received well over a thousand tips, and every one of those tips is followed up on um, to ensure that um, nothing's missed. Then they've come in from from all across the country. And where do you follow these tips? As far as can you outline a few of the tips that are the types of tips that you've received? Sure, we'll receive tips from people who um, from the the very generic from people who tell us that. I was, in a, I was in a grocery store or I was at some other local business and I believe I saw somebody who matches the description. People who call us to tell us that they live in a different state, but they believe this individual uh, resides uh, in their community, whether it be an apartment community or whether it be a residential home. Uh, people who tell us that um, they have uh, family members who they believe could have been involved and in where those people live and um, really, it, it runs the gamut of people who I think, uh, you know, see this story, realize how tragic it is that, that Rachel, a single mother, lost her life and they want to reach out and try to help. Um, and it's been great. And every one of those tips, we'll take every tip we can and, and we try to run them down to the ground. And I agree with you, sir, that, uh, we, you know, we know through the course of the investigation, this individual was here in Hartford County, most likely for a couple of weeks prior, several weeks prior to this happening. And I agree that there are people here in our community who know who he is. He resided with somebody when he was here. He, he, he ate at local stores. He had a home, and there are people who know who he is. And what we really need is those people to realize that this is a dangerous individual, and they, they really need to, to step up for the community and identify who he is. And this would probably be a good time to point out that the, the reward on giving us that piece of information currently stands at $35,000. We're going to get there now. Forensic Bureau said, excellent audio. I want their microphone, right? And Texas Ranger said, how much time was between the LA crime and Rachel's? About five months, because it was March 2023, the Los Angeles one, and then August 5th, Rachel Morin. To, to give us information that identifies that subject and helps us make an arrest in this case. Yes, sir. That's true. And, and you did speak about the family, and I, I know from speaking to you, from speaking to the major, uh, and even seeing, uh, meeting with the family members before a canvas that some of your people did back right before Christmas. Yes, sir. Um, that, you know, we've been working with the family. Obviously, as you said, we have uh, Rachel, you know, the mother of five, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a young mom, um, a sister, uh, a, a daughter. Um, this has really impacted very close family. Um, and then it's hit our community because we, we live in a very safe place, so it, it's hit our community as well. But um, how other how are we working with the family on uh, trying to solve this case? We speak with, with Rachel's family frequently, and, and I would agree with you, sir, that um, Rachel was a mother. She was a daughter. Um, she was a friend to many people. She was a part of this community. She was raised here. She lived here her entire life, and um, it was devastating to her family. Her, her children don't have a mother now. She is... Um, children under the age of 18 now. She has a, a child who unfortunately is, is disabled that now has to cope with not only a disability but the loss of their mother at a young age. Uh, her Rachel's mother um, is obviously devastated at, at the loss of her daughter. Her oldest daughter, who's uh, turned uh, 18, was 18 at the time of this, now has to try to navigate the beginning part of her adult life uh, without a mother. So. It affected everybody in Rachel's life, and she had a wide circle of friends, and of course, all of them were affected. And and to your point, sir, too, we do live in a safe community, and it, it definitely uh, 
upsets everybody and it makes it takes a little bit of that sense of safety away when something like this happens. And, and people ask about that all the time, the hiking trail. And um, we, we were just asked today, in fact, uh, on an interview, uh, are there cameras on the trail? And particularly somebody saw what they believe is a camera in the pedestrian tunnel going underneath Route 24. Uh, to my knowledge, there I know that the county is working to put cameras along the trail because of Rachel's case, but not in it. there were not cameras there, and I don't believe there's one in the tunnel. No, sir. There's there's no tunnels on the trail itself. I mean, no tunnels. No me. There's no cameras on the on the tunnel itself, on the trail itself, and the cameras in the surrounding area um, that uh, we captured the arrival of Rachel into the parking lot. We know where she was beforehand stop uh, shopping at a local target store we have video of that we certainly used video in this case to be able to track rachel's movements in the time uh, leading up to this until her arrival at the trail unfortunately after rachel arrives uh, and parks her car at the parking lot at the trailhead there's no more video uh, evidence after that right, and that might seem i don't know outlandish in some parts of our country but i have to say um, my backyard hits a portion of this trail and we've lived there for more than 20 years 22 23 um, you know, my daughters were raised going out there to be able to walk on the trail, my wife, me, um, and it, it just, it's so far outside the norm. I don't think many communities can understand just how, uh, what kind of feeling of safety there was prior to this case. Obviously, you know, this woke everybody up a little bit that were, as law enforcement will preach, you know, it, it can happen here and the worst things can happen here. And we saw that again in this case, sadly. Um, you talked about, so we talked about a little bit about working with the family and, uh, how about other agencies? Obviously this is a big case going from one side of the country to the other. How about other, uh, partners? Yes, sir. We've used, uh, multiple partners in this case and we still do on a, on a daily basis. Uh, the Maryland state police crime lab has been an integral partner on this and, uh, has helped us, uh, with the initial genetic links we made, but as we continue moving forward with the case has helped us, uh, with further processing of evidence. Um, we've used uh, federal partners to help us reach out uh, across the country to different places to conduct interviews, um, to give us uh, assistance, again, with uh, evidence processing and directions to, to take the case. Um, we've used uh, other local departments across the country when we needed to, to be able to conduct interviews and be able to uh, understand where potential suspects reside and, um, and crimes they may have committed in the past. We've used uh, laboratories from multiple states through the country to help so they can assist us try to track uh, the suspect as well. So we've received a, a tremendous amount of support from agencies throughout the country. Now, how has the community responded to your efforts during the canvases? Um, what's the response that the detectives are seeing? Uh, the response has been great from the community. They've uh, always been supportive of the sheriff's office my entire time working here, and they're continuing to be supporters of the sh supportive of the sheriff's office today. Um, I think the community has told us, the people we've spoken to, exactly what they saw, the people we've spoke to. I think if there's one thing that if I could, uh, hopefully people would understand, is that we know the suspect, and I touched on this before, was here in Harford County prior to this incident. He didn't arrive that day and leave that day. He was here beforehand. And when he was here, just like all of us in our daily lives, we interact with the people around us in businesses, we interact with people in restaurants, we reside somewhere, we have neighbors. Um, there are people who live in this community or who were in this community at the time of the event that um, certainly would have interacted and seen this suspect. And those are the people that we need to come forward and tell us who this person is and where he is now. Very important to get that information out there. Um, so someone was just asking if I've posted the Spanish flyer. I have uh, almost every week for a long time on x so if you follow me on there i posted it there this i must just make it a little bit bigger now there we go so this is the spanish flyer thank you to grizzly cat for sharing it now so that i could actually show everyone so this is what it looks like and if you could please share this on x as well i've just reposted it about 10 minutes ago or so grizzly cat also did so please please repost it as well okay all right so let's just uh, keep listening here to what else they say and uh, one thing, I'm just kind of looking through my notes I, um, to kind of frame my thoughts, but uh, jumping back, and it's a DNA answer, obviously, but we get the question, we, we put out there, obviously, this person's of Hispanic, our suspect from the video is of Hispanic descent. What makes us confident enough to say that? Mm. Uh, 
through the course of the investigation, uh, we obviously, like I said, we, we processed DNA and genetic material, and that, along with video evidence, uh, allows us to conclusively say that this person is from, has a Hispanic origin. So one of the things we got a whole lot, a whole, whole lot. On- That's good to know as well. This is from the genetic and DNA analysis as well. It's not just a guess, right? On our social media was really... I'm not saying that they would usually just guess. I'm just saying it's great to hear how they got to that conclusion. To the DNA, and it was, you know, if you have the DNA, how do you not have the name? And people weren't able to put that together. So um, w- with that, can you kind of explain why we don't have a name just because of a DNA match and then how confident you are or we are in the DNA match we have? So we are uh, highly confident that the DNA that we recovered from the crime scene points conclusive, conclusively to our suspect. However, the way DNA works is it is able at this stage to connect us through the CODIS database we spoke about to another unknown crime. There is no DNA database that would be able, allow me to be able to plug that in there and have it just, just give me a name. That's not how it works. Oh, I wish it worked like that, right? <laughs> it would be so cool if things just did work like that. You could just put in someone's DNA is like, oh, that's this person. Uh, Red Wolf says there should be a pic of the sketch on the flyers, though. Of course, this is breaking news from today. And we don't make the flyers. Um, I have made flyers before, though. But sometimes it takes the police a few days to update their flyers with the sketch and everything. Um, either way, we got to keep on sharing it and keep sharing the sketches. They just shared this uh, today now. As I say, that's why we're here discussing it after a full trial day, because it is breaking news and it's a huge uh, bit of new information in this case. And I'm just glad that there's progress being made because it felt really said for a while now of like man there's just like no news in this case there's just this this killer running around and we don't know where he is or who he is but they've got his dna and they've got the video but that's just so scary so i'm glad that there's some progress being made and now there's composite sketches i'm sure they'll update the flyers and they will be sharing that as well the only people that are um that are named in a CODIS database, people have committed a qualifying crime. So if you haven't been arrested and committed one of these crimes and been to prison, then your name is not in a database. There is no uh, you know, massive database with everyone's DNA. That's not how it works. But what it does allow us to do is to link these two crimes. And when we do locate our suspect, which we will, it will be able to conclusively link him to the crime scene. Right. Uh, and, and again, kind of related to that, one of the questions I get, because you know the DNA has told us of Hispanic descent is, Do we believe that the suspect in this case is in the country illegally? We know that the border is a big issue in our country right now. Um, My answer to that is uh, we don't know, and we don't want to rule that out, uh, nor do we want to um, say that's that's the way it is. It's just another possibility uh, because uh, we said he could be laying his head anywhere from Los Angeles to here or really anywhere in the world, so we don't know. So, I I mean, you – have any thoughts on that response? Uh, it, I mean, it definitely does complicate things. Uh, you're correct, sir, that he, he could be a U.S. citizen from California or a U.S. citizen from any other state. Obviously, um, there's been an influx of, of people from certain parts of the world here in the United States, and there's people who move through um, the, our southern border a little more uh, freely, and that does complicate things, and it allows people to be able to uh, – move and it, allow, it makes it uh, difficult to be able to track people through traditional means. It just adds another uh, a layer of complication. Okay. And again, yeah, one of the, to focus on that as being a fact when we don't know it would be wrong and to focus, to ignore that um, without knowing that's not the case would be wrong. So our, our, you know, we haven't been able to put it either way. So that's uh, an open-ended question, I guess, if you will. The big question I get all the time is, you know, why not a sketch? You have, you have the video, you addressed, you know, we have the video of him leaving because he didn't come in that door. Um, wh- where are we with some sort of sketch or something? So we, we began, we began the investigation and made this um, link. One of the first things we would do in any case is try to locate witnesses. Uh, one of those witnesses that we did locate in this case uh, was a victim of that California assault. Um, sketches uh, are, Absolutely a, a phenomenal investigative tool. However, they are one person's impression of what someone looks like. All of us view people differently, and it can change the way that sketch looks. Uh, we do have a sketch that we're planning on releasing soon. That This sketch was not one person's interpretation of what our suspect look like, but uh, looks like, but multiple people's impression, both uh, victims from California, witnesses here in uh, 
in Harford County, and then also uh, the artists using the video as part of the rendering as well. So being able to put all those three things together, we believe that we have a sketch now that um, is the closest uh, rendition we're going to be able to have, and we want the public to be able to see that as well. And, and it may actually be released ahead of this podcast, depending on uh, timing. If <laughs> Yeah, they release it at the same time. <laughs> they release the sketches and they post on Facebook. That's where you can find the link. Go to their Facebook page. I'll put it in the description box afterwards as well. But it's on the Harford County Sheriff's Department's Facebook page. It's on the X page um, and it's being shared widely on social media. So it's very easy to find as well. And their podcast is called Into the Sheriff's Spotlight. And this episode is six months later, an in-depth discussion on the Rachel Morin investigation. So that's what we listen to. We've got about nine minutes to go. Uh, depending on how it all works out. Yes, sir. So as far as the sketch goes, explain how important it is to try to get it as close as possible to the actual suspect and what efforts you took to make sure it's just not another Hispanic male being sought. So it's, it's uh, important to get this sketch as close as we can, because the one thing as an investigator, I don't want to do, I don't want someone to look at this sketch and think, well, I'm not going to call the sheriff's office and tell them that I think I know who the suspect is because he doesn't look enough like this sketch. So we want to make sure that we make this sketch as close as we can get it to the what the suspect looks like so that we can make sure people um, are confident when they're calling us and people understand what the suspect looks like. So in order to get the best quality we could, we utilized uh, uh, witnesses in California who were assaulted by the suspects. We used um, witnesses here in Harford County. Um, and then we also used uh, one artist to combine all, to, to interview each one of these people, and then that same artist to look at our video and be able to try to put all of that together to give us the closest um, that we could possibly get to what the suspect look like looks like. And then after that, we took that sketch and we talked to other witnesses who didn't maybe see the person as well and weren't confident in making a sketch, but did see the person and asked them, "Does this sketch look like?" the suspect that you saw so that we were sure that we had uh, as large a group of possible who we knew saw this person look at this sketch and say, yes, this is similar. Interesting. So it sounds like there were people on the trail that day because they were, there were dog walkers and people on the trail that may have spotted this individual. It sounds like that, right? Or to what the person I saw looks like. We definitely don't want to be out getting calls or um, in, in interviewing a lot of folks uh, just because they're Hispanic. Um, so a lot of effort was taken. And one of the things that, that I did hear, and I think it's important, is that we do have witnesses here in Hartford County. We do, sir. We have, we've interviewed multiple, many witnesses here in Hartford County. Uh, as I mentioned, Rachel uh, ran the trail frequently daily. And uh, a lot of those people came forward and told us just when they saw Rachel. We had other people come forward and tell us that, you know, we saw the video and that they felt like they saw someone who looked very similar to the video uh, on the trail in the weeks leading up to uh, Rachel's death. And, and there it is. That's why they say they think he was there in the weeks leading up to Rachel's murder. I know they're saying death, but it was a murder. They said it's a homicide investigation. So getting to know the area, in my opinion, premeditating his attack, right? And getting to know maybe someone's routine. So scary. The volume of people that we've spoken to who told us that they saw someone on the trail who looked similar to our suspects, to our suspect in the week leading up to the crime, um, makes me believe, as I said earlier, that this individual was here in our county for weeks prior to this event. So those witnesses have linked this particular individual that they personally saw to that trail and around the same time that Rachel was killed. Yes, sir. Yes. And I do think it's important to note we are one year out nearly from uh, what happened in Los Angeles and six months out from Rachel's homicide here. So, you know, we are at, this is what that person looked like six months ago, a year ago. Yes, sir. Um, which was consistent between the two because we've had people from here and there both kind of say this is a more accurate rendition so um, or rendering, I guess, is more appropriate. So, uh, again, there's been some time. So, you know, hair grows out or, in my case, falls out. It, you know, people can change their look. So we're asking people to, when they see the 
both the video and the images to be mindful of this is um, now six month. Six month anniversary. And when uh, right. we release these sketches, one of the things that the, the public will see is there's two sketches. One of these sketches uh, is this person, uh, his facial features only, and the other one shows the individual wearing a, a hat, a red baseball style cap. Uh, that cap, that hat, is something that we know from interviewing uh, different witnesses is something that the suspect has worn in the past. So, it, again, to your point, sir, people's, uh, people can change the way they appear through gaining weight, losing hair, wearing hats and sunglasses and, and things like that. And, and so w- with all of this we've discussed so far, um, again, six months in, wh- where do we stand today? Uh, today we stand that uh, still every day we're working this investigation. We're speaking to witnesses. We're still um, working with uh, allied agencies and partners federally on the federal side and on the state side. Um, we're interviewing uh, witnesses as late as uh, this morning. We were speaking to somebody. Um, we're using every available tool that we have to try to find this individual. And I, I know, you know, again, many, many years of doing this, there are cases that stick with all of us. How are your investigators doing with the the personal aspect? You know, we, we, we can't even imagine being in Rachel's family's shoes, you know, the, again, back to the children losing their mom, just the devastation to, to this family, um, you know, not trying to compare it in scope in any way imaginable to that. But obviously with a police officer, you know, this, this kind of case sticks with you. How are, how are your people doing with that? I think um, they're motivated. I think they – look at a crime like this and the tragedy that it caused and the violence that was involved both here in California and and in Maryland. And they're motivated. They want to find this person and um, they want to take them off the streets so that no one else is injured. And they want to bring justice to Rachel and to her family. So uh, they're working hard and they're motivated every day. And uh, I have confidence that, uh, that they're going to find this individual. And I I tell you, we all, we all pray for that outcome for sure. And again, I got to, and you know, I'll let you offer any thoughts or the major uh, on our Hartford County community. Again, you know, we've been through some over uh, the last 10 years or so, been through some devastating events. This, this case is up there and, and the things that have impacted our community. Um, uh, what kind of words do you think about sharing in reference to our Harford County community? Well, I mean, I would start by saying to the, the community as a whole that uh, we, I appreciate everything they've done so far. We've received, hundreds and hundreds of tips directly from the community here. Um, They're always willing to speak to us. We've done multiple canvases through the community, and everyone always is is willing to come out and speak to us to tell us what they saw to try to help us. Um, I would just ask that um, they continue to do that, to try to remember Rachel, remember the area that she was in, to if anybody remembers anything moving forward that they think it's important or not. If it's a small detail, those small details can be the details that, that, that break the case open. Um, so I'd ask them to do that. And uh, anybody who hasn't reached out to us, uh, who saw anything that day, who is aware of a person who uh, was in the area then and isn't here now, if they've seen a, the, the video and they have a basic idea what this person looks like or when they look at our sketch, do they know that person here? Is he here now? Did he leave? Did you see this person because you worked with him? Uh, any information that they can, uh, they can provide would be great. The... Um and just one thing to add is the local business community has moved mountains to help investigators and during the investigation and not only the local business community, but the national business community and, and some, some offerings from big companies in the surveillance world that have really stepped forward to, uh, to give us a hand, which has moved us forward. And it, it can't go um, unsaid that we have more offerings uh, coming in every single day we do uh, every day, and I think everybody looks at this case and they realize how tragic and needless it was and um, how devastating it was for Rachel's family. And I think uh, our community here is, is a close community, and it's a safe community. And I think when people hear or see something like this, the first thing they want to do is they want to help. And we have had a, a tremendous amount of help from within the community, business community, from uh, from the state and from people out of state as well who just want to try to do the right thing and, and find this person before here at someone else. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just, um, I guess, around the room, any closing thoughts before we wrap this uh, special edition broadcast, uh, podcast, spotlight, the sheriff spotlight before we wrap up uh, this episode? 
I, I would just uh, reiterate again, uh, and anybody who has, has seen anything or anybody who feels like they have information that could help the investigation, please reach out to the sheriff's office and, and let us know what you have. Every bit of information that we can develop or that is provided to us is followed up on. And you never know what that tip is going to, to mm-hmm. lead to. Um, so if even the smallest bit of information, please come forward and provide detectives with an opportunity to follow up. And I'll say both Andy and, and the major uh, have, have said it. Um, I, I, I've said that in many interviews. We're, we're one good tip away from a name that lets us bring this down and get this guy off the street. My fear is uh, that wherever he is, he's going to do something like this again. And um, some other family, some other community is going to be um, suffering as we have. And we certainly, again, we don't want uh, Rachel's family to be you know to have another uh family going through what rachel's families had to deal with through this loss um and and if anyone has any tips and again as the major said no matter how small it might seem like the most insignificant thing and not worth bothering the police it's worth bothering the police um rm tips uh, rachel Bourne, rm tips at harfordsheriff.org and the phone lines 410-836-7780 Eight eight for the tip line. Wasn't that wonderful? Don't you wish all sheriff's departments could do that? Like, damn, they did a podcast episode. They've done lots of, you know, media updates on their Facebook page. They're really ahead of the game. By the way, for you guys asking what cap this is, um, this one is an example because it's got this. I don't know if that's the well, yeah, it's the exact cap because they not this cap. I'm saying the with a black bill would be a cap like this, which he had left behind, right? That's what they said at the Los Angeles home invasion. So there's many variations of this cap. Um, It is a Nike Air Jordan Jumpman metal logo one. I don't know if his one is actually a metal logo or it would be embroidery. You also get the embroidery ones as well, embroidered ones. So yeah, this is an example of it. So that you could see it a little bit more clearly. As you can see, it's like a little basketball man jumping. Michael Jordan, off he goes. So, wow. This is youth on it, so I don't know. You probably get very many different types of it. If you just type in Nike Air Jordan Red Cap on Google, you're going to see so many examples of it. Also, um, they did say that the unidentified man is described as 5 feet 9 inches tall, 160 pounds, 20 to 30 years old with dark hair and a muscular frame and is believed to be of Hispanic descent. Anyone with information leading to an arrest and conviction is subject to a $35,000 reward, the statement said. So that is the update that we have now. Um, Is there anything else? I think I've actually shared everything I wanted to share with you on this case. And man, I really hope that they get the, the tip that they need to identify this alleged stalker and killer and uh yeah put him put him where he belongs so that he can't hurt any more people based on the little bit we already know about him right so (laughs) kiwi said slight tweak needed to be added to the sketch devil horns yeah this sounds like a very violent perpetrator we don't know what his motive would be but if they say that he entered the home and attacked two people who couldn't defend themselves. And then this third individual, which sounded like a young man, intervened and chucked him out the house and all of that. They were screaming and everything. Okay. It could be that he's um, he's got sexual motives and violence, of course, which is, as John Kelly, criminal profiler, said, um, it's like a budding serial killer. I mean, if he's between 20 and 30, yeah. I mean, it's it can only get worse from here. Someone like that... <laughs> I don't know if they're ever just going to be like, oh, well, I'm just going to stop now. Probably not, right? High risk behavior as well. Very high risk behavior. This guy seems to enjoy the risk, especially based on the Los Angeles um, home invasion. But then to think that he completely changed his MO and went somewhere where he's probably studied the area, got to know that walking trail, got to know people's routines, and there were no cameras. And he probably knew that. And where he, it was, what a vulnerable spot where he attacked Rachel Moran. We've looked at videos before, you know, people have got out there and walked it and share those videos. So go and check that all out on the playlist. As I say, if you want to know more about this case, 
Um, let me just do this. I'll just be here. Okay, if you want to know more about this case, we have done a deep dive on this many times before. So please keep sharing it. Someone in chat was saying we should do like Fugitive Friday and share it every Friday. But the thing is, you can do that because we've done the deep dive. We just need to keep getting the information out. So every Friday, if you want to, in your own mind, like Fugitive Friday. Okay, every Friday, go to the episodes or go to the Facebook pages, whatever, and share. Share, you know? At least once a week, um, I tried to share all these flyers. Of course, we tried to do that in many cases. But uh, yeah, it really helps if you guys as well, because we are a community and there's power in numbers. So if you guys share it and tag me on X, then I could just repost it and so we go, you know? So we just keep it going. I really hope that they will catch this... Um, this person soon and well done to the police damn i mean <laughs> i just they podcasted everything that they've done it's just amazing the work that they've done let me show you this quickly uh, which is this one i'll link this for you harford county sheriff's office on facebook is what it's called okay so i'm just showing you that again that's the link i'm going to put in for you and now i'm going to call it a day already in the next day for me it's 10 past one in the morning thank you so much for watching the adam montgomery trial with me today thank you so much then also for coming here and watching this case coverage with me today i really appreciate it uh you guys give me a voice as well to be able to do my best you know to help raise awareness in these cases and yeah let's look forward to the day where they cuff whoever this guy is i really like i wish the delphi you know law enforcement would also talk that way about the sketches because initially when they release sketches some of the com communication was very confusing, <laughs> right? I know hindsight's twenty twenty, but like it's kind of confusing. They're like, "Don't call us for the next two weeks," all that kind of stuff. It was a little bit weird. In this case, I don't know. Law enforcement—they're doing such a brilliant job and just saying any tip. If you think you know him, if you think you see him, call it in. You just never know. <laughs> Heather says, "I can hear Sunny saying, go to bed, G.' She's definitely saying it. Definitely. If Sunny's out there, if she sees me putting a post out there on X, just, she's going to say, you you go to bed. And if you guys don't know who Sunny is, Sunny was on the show again. She's been on here many times on Saturday talking about the Adam Montgomery trial. So go and check that out um, if you haven't seen it yet. Thank you so much, everyone. Mods, oh my goodness. Thank you so much. That was a lot of hours today of your hard work. I really appreciate everything you do. Thanks to everyone who bought me coffees and bought the mods coffees. We certainly need it. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. I will see you all again very soon and may there be justice for Rachel Moran.